If you enjoy the channel and our video content and would like to support us, you can do this in a couple of ways. You can sign up to our Patreon site which is a monthly subscription to one of our four tiers, each giving you something different from early access interviews up to exclusive unseen footage. There's also the option of a one-off donation via PayPal which allows you the option to donate an amount of your choice. Both options really help to keep this channel going and to continue putting out regular content for you good folk. So please take a look at aircurrentreview.tv forward slash donate and I thank you in advance. Thank you and enjoy. Sonny, when did you first become interested in aviation? Well, it's been a long story. Uh, very candid. My father was a fighter pilot. I took a lot of lead from him, been on air bases for the 42 years of my life, well, initially, all the time. So it really impressed me, uh, the swagger of a fighter pilot. That's one. Jet noise, sound of freedom. Uh, smelling uh, jet petroleum in the morning. So it, it was uh, genetic more than anything else. Um, and the inspiration, obviously, Top Gun 1, which was my time, uh, which, which really uh, put the final nail in the coffin. It was a good uh, 18 years uh, till the time I could make it to the academy. So that was about it. So what year did you actually join the Air Force? Well, we started off back in 1999, uh, once I joined the academy in, um, in uh, Risalpur, uh, which is one of the uh, um, northern areas of Pakistan, and uh, started flying on the Mashak initially, which is MFI-17, single-seater, uh, sorry, dual-seater, uh, slow prop aircraft, which is for, for primary flying training moved on to basic flying with the T-37. So that is where the initiation of aviation and true letter and spirit took place for me. And how long was your basic training on them basic aircraft? Well, uh, in the number of hours, uh, we were to do a syllabus of about uh, 300 plus minus, uh, which took about eight odd months considering uh, weather conditions and um, other challenges that come came about. And we were discussing uh, off air because you also th uh, flew the T thirty eight as a student. Was this in your initial training period, or was this later on in your career? No. Once I had earned my wings from the academy, um, I was a flying officer when I went across to stateside, and we did our. Um, fighter conversion training with them on the T-38, where we stand back in a few interesting um, A to A, A to ground um, uh, sorties. Other than that, we also trained with them, uh, with the USAF for a span of about a year, um, starting from um, Columbus Air Force Base, Mississippi. We went to Randolph in uh, San Antonio moved on and finished our uh, stint with them uh, with IFF uh, program, which is Introduction to Fighter Fundamentals at Moody Air Force Base, Valdosta, Georgia. Um, but it was it was a good one year where we learned to employ the T-38, which is a low aspect ratio platform, considering its comparison to uh, my subsequent weapon system, which is the Mirage. So it was good step up. Um, a lot of learning uh, value, a lot of um, interesting times as well, uh, flying in weather, through the weather, um, the, uh, the successes as well as the failures that came along the way. Um, and obviously, it's, uh, it's, it's all learning. Uh, but we learned a lot. And we learned and we brought that back to uh, Pakistan as well once we... Uh, finished our tenure with them. I mean, that must have been great as a young man going over to America, flying the Talon. That must have been like, wow, this is really cool. Yes, absolutely. It was a, a dual engine um, uh, after burning aircraft, which uh, did have uh, a lot of kick in it initially. 
Uh, before this, we had flown the K8, uh, which is the Karakura Mate. It's something like the T45 Gauss shock or uh, the Hawk hundreds uh, that are there. So it was um, it was a step up, no questions asked. The employment uh, domain was different. We were able to push the aircraft to its max possible envelope within the air to air or the air to ground domain. So a lot of learning points, a lot of, as I mentioned, um, a lot of uh, successes and a lot of uh, a lot of learning points. So we've we've come we we came a long way from where we were initially, and uh, once we joined uh, the joined with the USAF in their flying program, um, and it was interesting our time. But overall, did you enjoy your time over there? Yes, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Uh, to fly with um, uh, an Air Force which is doing things differently, let's put it that way, uh, because their threat perception is different, their strategies, tacti tactics are different. Um, so it's always good to uh, interact and mingle with these, uh, with, with varying uh, domains. Um, one interesting um, Quip or um, anecdote which I remember, um, and that is how I got my TAC call sign, which is Ob1 um, from the infamous Star Wars. Yes. So uh, we were flying this offensive BFM uh, sortie. I was all pumped up, uh, wanting to um, take down the adversary, which was um, flying his aircraft or his talent to about 75% of its performance, um, uh, performance envelope in a high G turn. So as soon as I came in and I steadied my sight behind the aircraft and I was uh, pulling approximately the same amount of Gs and I told my uh, safety pilot, which was the instructor pilot at the back, that I'm, I'm ready to take the shot and he said, go for it. And as soon as I uh, yanked back at the stick a minor degree, and that is the time I heard the sound and the alarms blaring in my headset and in my helmet, uh, which indicated an over G situation. I had overstressed the aircraft in the, in the very first uh, <laughs> uh, air to air combat scenario. Wow. Well, dejected initially. Uh, but as soon as we landed back, uh, we could identify that there was a challenge or a limitation within the um, algorithm or the software of the T-38C. Um, so there was no excessive yank, but it was over g We reverted back. The aircraft went through a battle damage check as well. There was nothing wrong. Um, so second sortie, same mission, OB-1. I overstressed the jet again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my IP says there's nothing wrong with the aircraft. There's something wrong with you. <laughs> so we went back to the sims, practiced a bit more of uh, high G maneuvering, and subsequently things things went through. Uh, but uh, by the end of the program, everybody uh, called me um, uh, Ob One from Star Wars, considering the Ob One. Uh, sortie as well. So interesting times, good learning value again. Brilliant stuff. And did you know you were going to go on to the Mirages after your training or were the F-16s even about with the Pakistan Air Force at that time? Yes, they were there. Uh, the Vipers were there, absolutely. But um, something that we had been told because of the track record of the previous group who was there um, with the USAF. So they came back and went on to the, to, to the Mirage 3s uh, immediately. So we were expecting the same. So nothing different. Um, but obviously, a step from T-38 to the Mirage platform was a step up again. Um, and a few of us went to the Viper as well, not myself. I stuck around with the Mirage for the duration of my career. And what were your first thoughts of the Mirage? Because it's a beautiful looking jet, isn't it? Yes, it is gorgeous. Absolutely. It's excellent uh, in the profile that it is employed for. It is not built especially in the present domain of fly-by-wire and um, high, ma highly maneuverable aircrafts uh, like the Viper or the Su-30 or uh, the JF-17, for example. So it's, it's not meant for air-to-air combat anymore. Yes, back in the 
ages once it was initially designed it's a late 50s design manufactured and distributed in the 60s to the israelis as well as the uh, the egyptians uh, the swiss the pakistanis as well subsequently so for that time it was a good interceptor aircraft but not anymore for now it is all to do with uh, air to ground weapon delivery capability and it does its job extremely well in that domain one of the squadrons was in the interceptor role yes but majority of the fleet was all to do with air to ground uh, weapon and delivery platforms may it be the durandal um, the anti or the runway denial weapon that was there um, we had a few other mark 82s as well as um, uh, some mirage uh, fleet was also uh, retrofitted with uh, strike element for night sorties which an hmd and everything so that was their standoff weapon capability was also um, being utilized which is still being utilized and the world has seen it happen in the 2019 event as well did the pakistan air force have any recce jets yes to be very candid my first assignment after conversion onto the mirage uh, was in the same squadron oh. uh, so we did fly or i did fly or get um, qualified on uh, the uh, reconnaissance platform which was at that time uh, the lorap or long range aerial photography module or the mod that we had we also had the f100 and the f200 but now the um, capability has been moved ahead from mirage to the to the vipers so let's get into some nitty gritty here, Sonny. Uh, what was your ground training like on the Mirage? Did it feel like a leap forward coming from the, the Talon? Well, considering technologies, the T-38C had, a, had a, well, two MFDs, glass cockpit, hard everything. Um, the initial Mirage aircraft or the conversion on which we used to do or which is still being done is... Um, uh, it is a very uh, rudimentary uh, cockpit, ergonomically not very strong, um, no glass cockpits, uh, a rudimentary sight or a gun sight or a weapon delivery sight uh, for A to ground. So it was, if I were to say, a step down instead of a step up. So we oh. had to uh, relearn the paradigms of uh, how to uh, be more of a... Uh, more of a seat of a seat of the pants flyer than uh, anything else because uh, it was all the feel that we had to generate may it be the dact that we did the dissimilar air combat training with other aircraft um, or uh, the air to ground weapon delivery the, the mirage spoke uh, well to everyone who wanted to speak to it um, so the seat of the pants thing was more than any um, huge avionics on board. Later on, once we finished conversion, as I mentioned, I moved on to the recce platform. There were um, intercept platforms as well, which were more um, uh, more glass cockpit uh, oriented than anything else. And was there a simulator in your time? Well, uh, once again, this was rudimentary. We had the link trainer, as we used to call it. It, it was uh, good for IF or instrument flying, uh, but not really good for anything to do with um, air to air combat uh, or simulated training or on weapon delivery. Radar intercepts, yes, uh, we did uh, practice that as well on the on the trainer or the simulator. It was a lot less like the high fidelity sims that we have right now, which mm. can give you a force feedback on the stick um, and the judder in a high G turn that you can feel as well. So it was, uh, it was, it wasn't anything like that. Uh, it was mm -hmm. a rather rudimentary, conventional sort of a link trainer than anything else. And can you remember your first uh, flight in the Mirage? And could you feel the kick from the afterburner? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, although we had come in for, from the T-38s with uh, two afterburning engines, um, the Mirage did have its, um, its peculiar kick. Uh, the uh, rush was quick. Um, it had a high-speed takeoff as well. 
mm-hmm. which was uh, you, you really had to roll the aircraft on the runway before you broke ground. Um, so it was um, it was the initial kick, and then you really had to give a good cross check on how or what the engine is doing. Is there any malfunction taking place on the emergency panel or the T eighteen panel, as we used to call it? So it was. Um, it was it was interesting for uh, for the initial bit, but well, as in every aircraft, you get used to it. Uh, but yes, it was it was very nice initially. Was that in a two? Was the two seaters, or was that in a single seat for yourself? Your first. Well, flight? initially we did fly in the two seaters, but we do have the single seat as well. We call it the DP and the single seat. DP is dual pilot and single seat for single seat. Um, single occupant. So the DP was initially utilized for um, uh, the initial conversion training before we went solo or we went into a chase sortie, as we call it. Um, So DP was there. DPs are still there. They're being flown for IF or instrument flying profiles and other um, uh, air to ground weapon delivery platforms as well. And what were the, some of the strengths and weaknesses of the Mirage 3, uh, the Mirage 5 even? It's extremely good at low level. Uh, I flown the T-38 and a few other aircrafts as well. The uh, smoothness that is generated extremely at, low, at extremely low level altitudes uh, because of its um, uh, surfaces at the back. Uh, we call them pitch dampers. Uh, they were in the inboard sections of the wing, right next to the wing <clears> root. <throat> so, whenever we used to run in at low level, there was absolutely trim off the aircraft, hands off, and the aircraft could could go straight for a very long distance. Um, second thing is, it was very heavy. Uh, it's a very heavy aircraft. Oh. Considering that fact, it's once the momentum's generated and it's uh, pitched, um, it, it, it is trimmed correctly. It can do a lot at low level. Beyond this, it's always had the zero G acceleration capability uh, because of a, a tailless delta platform. It was just one wing, so you could really bunt the aircraft continuously in a zero G profile, and the aircraft could accelerate because there was no induced drag or lift dependent drag being generated on the wings. The vortices were being very comfortably placed as well. So that was another part. In clean configuration, it used to give a lot of uh, thrust to weight ratio, uh, which we used to do in the FCF or the functional check flights. Uh, We used to start off at immediately after takeoff low level till the time we reached uh, about 550 knots and then pull a zoom up climb till about 40,000 feet, go inverted and do our functional check flight. So it it has its uh, pluses and it for the time, if I were to say, uh, for the duration of uh, the 60s and the 70s, I believe it was the go-to aircraft for any Air Force of the world. Absolutely. So in your training phase, can you talk, talk us through some of your flying training you would actually conduct? Well, obviously, the pre-solo or the chase sorties that we used to do were the initial times in which we were in a dual or a DP aircraft, and we used to do a lot of touch and goes so that we could get our hands on how the aircraft is feeling, especially during the um, base turn, because it was, once again, a fixed pass setting, and we used to be in a continuously descending turn to Mm -hmm. make it to the runway. The important thing here, which we were taught and we learned in the process was um, that the aircraft is supposed to be flown to the runway, not landed to the runway, just like every other aircraft. The Mm. aircraft was flown to the runway because of its high angle of attack. Um, There were times once uh, the nose in the front was high enough so that you couldn't see uh, what is coming ahead. So for especially the guys sitting in the back seat or the Gibbs that we had or the safety pilots, they were flying mostly by looking on the peripheries and feeling the aircraft settling down on the runway instead of looking in front. Hmm. So it was it was peculiar. So that was the initial phase. Then you went into the um, uh, the um, advanced handling phase in which we used the we flew the aircraft in every possible um, angle of attack. 
aspect as well as uh, altitude and speed it was interesting because we uh, did fly the aircraft at zero speed uh, or zero knots uh, meaning there by the aircraft continued we chopped the throttles back the aircraft continued to fly fly increase the angle of attack and once the air speed indicator or the asi re- read zero that is the time we pushed the nose down right. gradually unloaded and then we accelerated so zero speed is also that that is something which was there moved into the a to air role uh, we did uh, not dact in the initial training but uh, within um, the role of either a high to low intercept or one versus one or one versus two profile we did practice that a bit but as i mentioned it was basically an a to ground weapon Uh, so we really hit it hard in um, the high well uh, dive bombing profile as well as the level bombing um, we did do a lot of airfield strikes as well because that was its role with the mm-hmm. durandal that it carried um, so we we did a lot in our initial training mm-hmm. uh, within the ocus that we we conducted And you kind of mentioned the cockpit before because I've seen um Raj 3 cockpit and it looks quite small was it actually comfy for a pilot Well uh, to be candid I'm almost 6 feet so I was uh, rather comfortable with it with head clearance from the mm-hmm. uh, canopy as well um and leg space was decent um well to be very candid I have not heard of any 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 mishaps during the ejection as well uh, okay. so the majority of the people have come out safe in one piece not a problem with the martin bakers on board um, other than this the car- cockpit ergonomics yes the switches were a bit ha- wayward in different variants because we had a lot of variants of the mirage mirage 3 um, el um, uh, the dp itself then we had the um uh, a few variants x french uh, pa2s pa3s pas as well so we really had to you know once you sat in the cockpit you really had to find out okay this is the version i'm looking at and mm-hmm. the switches are here 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 so we need to be conversant with them before we initiate the initiate the uh, start cycle or the ignition of the engines um so it was interesting times And did you uh, wear the French uh, flight gear, the helmets, G suits, or because I've seen, I think uh, a couple of like looks like British, you know, kit over there. But did, for the Mirage, was it all French gear? No, not really. We we all had Americans and MBUs, okay. which were the masks conventionally used by all fighter pilots within the Air Force. Same headgear as well. Helmets were in different, mm-hmm. um, uh, as well as the G suits. The connectors were also the same, give or take a few with mm-hmm. different aircrafts or different versions. But uh, yeah, there was nothing, nothing grow, uh, very different from what we did on any other aircraft. Mm-hmm. So you kind of mentioned before again but uh, what was your first frontline squadron Uh well it was the Reki uh squadron which is uh, now holding the uh, F16s the um it's the, it's the it, it was revamped by the Vipers in 2010 um, okay. and presently they're flying the same um obviously uh, we were the last of the Mohicans as we call it Uh, in the end because uh, after that the aircraft did get phased out from the squadron and um, it was the number 5 multi role squadron uh, mm-hmm. at that time and how many jets were typically on a frontline squadron uh, with the pakistan air force well it varies uh, from one place to another but anything between 13 to 18 squ- aircraft is there in every squadron And maybe can you tell us what a typical day like is on a frontline squadron on a Mirage 3? Well, uh, it needs to start early uh, because in our um, in our hemisphere it gets to be very hot very quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so first light takeoffs was something which everybody liked because it was relatively better and by about 11 <clears throat> the last sortie or the last wave uh, which was the third wave for the day was also taking off. 
So we were comfortable in the morning hours. And obviously, once the sun set, then night flying is also one of the things that really came about. So early morning, early breaks, go back home, go to your uh, BOQs, have a rest, and then come back for the evening or the late night slots for night flying as well. So it was... It was mostly like that, depending on, once again, the scenario and the circumstance, uh, whichever um, exercise that we were being a part of, it depended on it as well. It also depended on depended on the um, security situation of the country. So it was a mix mix of a few things. And when you were flying on the recce Mirage, did you always did you fly clean or were you tanked up? Oh, well, interestingly, uh, uh, tanked up uh, because uh, we really had to do long duration sorties. Uh, so we had to have a lot of fuel on it. Um, so conventionally, it was to do with 1300 liter tanks, um, mm. both wings uh, on the um, uh, internal pylons. And sometimes it used to be the SST or the supersonic tanks. Uh, before I joined 1700 liter tanks, which were even bigger in yeah. size, hence a lot more drag and a lot more weight, uh, they were uh, utilized as well. Uh, but not with me. I, I've flown the 1300 at the maximum. But they were big enough, gave us enough uh, flight time to employ our cameras uh, for the purpose uh, that we were flying, may it be training or real time operations. And what range could you get out with, uh, you know, carrying them 1,300 tanks on? Uh, this is uh, an answer which I can give you, but then I would have to kill you. Uh, pardon <laughs> me for that. But this is, well, confidential information. Right. So I'll give you a random number. It could go to anything with a radius of action about 300 nautical miles. Let's oh. keep it there. And did the Mirage have any uh, in-flight refueling capability? Uh, well, it has now. Uh, okay. Once uh, in, uh, in the proof of concept was taking place, um, I was on my way out from the Mirage fleet. But I did fly uh, the Mirage with the probe, uh, as we call it in the A to A refueling or in flight refueling capability. Um, so, yes, it is there and it is being utilized as we speak. And I have to ask, obviously, did you ever get a chance to fire or drop any live weapons from the Mirage? Yes. Uh, in exercises, in true letter and spirit, live weapons, Mark 82s, to be very exact. Wow. Uh, we did drop them um, in, a, in a dive bombing profile. Um, and one could really feel uh, the disconnect as soon as it went off. Oh, really? Uh, the wings. Yeah, you could really, really feel it as well as the center line pylon. So as soon as you drop board, it, you could hear it tuck, tuck, and you could feel the aircraft growing lighter as we uh -huh. used to pull away from the dive profile. So, um, yeah, been there, done that. Uh, to be very candid, it, as I mentioned, Durandal was there. We also had the um, uh, level bombing capability. The Mac 82s were there. Uh, we were able to carry R550s in air to air combat, uh, M120, uh, sorry, not one, M9, M9Ps, which were rather rudimentary rear aspect missiles, but they were good in their own domain in close combat in a dogfight. Um, so, yeah, it, it had some decent capability, um, not to mention the um, recce parts that it could carry, F100, 200s, as well as the low app that it did. Um, so it uh, for the time and the purpose, as I mentioned before, it was it was the go to aircraft for a lot of roles. And one of our favorite subjects on this channel, Sonny, is DACT. So do you have any great stories of fighting, you know, the Mirage against other types? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, as I mentioned, it's not a it's not a dog fighter of the present time. So we've uh, done DACT with the Viper uh, as well as the. Um, F7PG and the F7Ps, which is once again a variant of the MiG-21. Um, so it, it failed decently well with the latter two, but the Viper was a very different platform. It had turn rate capability of extremely high Gs in circumstances. Uh, if I remember a few 
scenarios. Um, uh, in one of the fights, once again, I was trailing behind an F-16. And as soon as I was about to bring my nose onto him, I could literally see the F-16 pivot in front of me <laughs> and go head on and go vertical. And I wow. was, the only thing I could do is I could see the aircraft going up and away. Uh, because the air, the Mirage didn't have the turn rate capability, a sustained turn rate. It, it was really well good to do with a, a turn, aim, fast, short, and then unload, exit, come back for another pitch back into the fight. So it was there. But in a sustained turn rate, uh, the F-16 was uh, was completely overpowering the Mirage. So that was one. I could literally see the F-16 pivot in front of me and give wow. me a head on and fly away. Wow. Um, the other, there was, we were another 2v1 DACT. The, the Viper was 1v2 Mirages. So the Viper was tagging the other uh, Mirage from its tail and taking the shot. I was settling behind it as well. I was at extremely low energy state, just about to bring my nose onto the Viper. And I could see the Viper going wings level, max afterburners and going vertical and wow. getting away from us. And we couldn't do anything because the energy levels were low. Mm -hmm. And by the time I was doing this, the Viper took a complete loop and came behind me, took my shot, and we disengaged and knocked it off. Considering domains, it's not built for the present day DACT. Mm -hmm. uh, it's excellent for the role that it carries, which is once again um, now into standoff weapon capability and A to ground delivery. 